Well, uh, Michael. Hello, welcome to Asia Pacific Business Strategies. This is a program that comes to you uh, twice a month from a studio in Honolulu at ThinkTech. And what we try to do in this program is we try to show some of the leading people, companies, ideas, and the forces that are shaping the lives of people in the Asia Pacific region in general. So we've done a lot of programs that come in from Asia. We've done some programs that come in from California and the mainland of the US. And that's what we're going to be doing today, is we're connecting with a gentleman, Robert Kramars, in Encinitas, California. And Robert is one of the leading lights of the venture capital community in Southern California. If you're an investor looking to invest in small companies, growing companies, or if you're a growing company looking for capital in Southern California, chances are you run into Rob Kramars at some point. Um, he runs a group called Intelliversity, and there's a lot of online activities and a lot of face-to-face uh, -face activities, seminars, and Rob has been in the field for many years, and he has experience in guiding entrepreneurs to the right investor and guiding investors to the right entrepreneur so that they match their expectations. Rob Kramars, welcome. Good, to good, uh, good afternoon to you. Good to see I, you. I think it's afternoon for you, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. So I wanted to start, Rob, with a short video off of your website that it's, it, it's titled The Neglected 97%. So let's look at that video and then you know what it says. I'd like you to talk to us a little bit about who's neglected and why it's 97%. Can we So this video says, too many great companies don't get funded. Uh, talk to us about the 97%, the neglected 97. Well, the, the roughly 1% of companies seeking venture capital investment ever receive it. Hmm. And roughly 3% of companies seeking private individuals, we call them angels, ever receive that. So. Roughly 97% of companies, many of them, maybe most are deserving, never receive funding to actualize their dreams and their ambitions. So why That's is the that? neglected 97%. Why is that? The reason is, from personal experience, the whole model that both angels and VCs use to select companies is broken. They do a, they, ostensibly do a great job of choosing companies. They go through due diligence and vetting and all this stuff, hmm. and they still fail 90% of the time, hmm. at very most 80% of the time. In other words, the best VCs lose 80% of their companies hmm. in the first two, two, three years. Lose them, they fail, they run out of money, they give up, same thing with angels. So what kind of system will tolerate a loss rate of 80 to 90 percent even after all the hard work they do to assess meanwhile the other 97 percent of companies never even get a shot at the money hmm. and so I experienced this, so is a bro this is a broken model that I'm determined and my partners are determined to fix so what's what's yeah. your prescription how do we fix that doctor <laughs> I need my, this microphone and headset is like a stethoscope, right? <laughs> right. So I'm out of your heart. Well, there were really, there were, we discovered two things wrong with it. One was that the selection process was wrong, all wrong, focusing on the wrong things. And we'll get back to that in a second. And, sec and, and by the way, we've proven now that we're right. I'll tell you about that also. And this is important for the entrepreneur because once you know what's wrong with the system and how to fix it, you'll be much more likely to get an invest, investment in your company. Secondly, it was the structure of the investment mod, model that's, that's used primarily, either loans for later stage companies or buying stock equity shares as the early stage model distorts the entire process of investing because now the investors 
have to have a huge return because the selection model is broken. They know they only get one out of 10, maybe two that will ever pay off. Right. So they've got to have this huge gargantuan uh, payoff, 10 to 30 times the invested amount in order for the company even to be interesting. So but we have two things whole, broken. The whole selection model profile and, gets the, skewed. and the vehicle being used together make a, a market that leaves 97% of the companies out. That answer your question? Yes. Go back yeah. to that first one. How do we yeah. how, how how do we change the investor's model for how he evaluates uh, companies? So we're very focused. We're completely focused on the ability of the management team to scale revenues. Hmm. If the if the product and market are chosen correctly, there are profits. But we're concerned with the ability of management to scale the revenues, hmm. not to get more investment capital, but to scale the revenues. Mm -hmm. And the ability of a manager, of a CEO or founder, to scale revenues is never examined by most investors. Hmm. They look at the product market mix, uh, the growth of the market, and all those kind of factors, mm -hmm. but they don't examine the human being. Hmm. And the primary uh, issue is, can that CEO operate under stress during a rapid growth period? Hmm. Most, most look really good in the boardroom hmm. and during the presentation, hmm. and so we invest on how they look in the old model. And then 18 months later, when they crack under pressure, hmm. and a variety of pressures occur at that point, uh, then they show their real colors. Hmm. We had to find and we have found a way to measure the ability of the CEO to scale the company under stress. Hmm. And then you have growth in revenues, and then we can use a different model for investing. So what would that different model be, one that's focused on the scaling revenues? Well, once we can be assured to some degree of uh, comfort that this team and this CEO can manage a company during rapid growth under stress, then we can comfortably accept their projections of revenue growth. Hmm. You see how the two go together? Sure. Otherwise, it's just fantasy. Right. Well, if you can't manage the stress, then how do we expect you to, to actually achieve these so, projections? Rob, how, how so, do you, how do you, you stress let test, me answer your question. How do you stress test the manager, Rob? <laughs> uh, well, you, we, do, we have a program which is called Boot Camp, Entrepreneur's oh, Boot Camp, okay. which has been developed, and I'm now part of the team that delivers Boot Camp in conjunction with Shepherd Ventures, a leading venture capital firm here in San Diego who has three times the success rate in selecting winning companies by using the boot camp than other VCs have. Okay. Lucky break that I ran into these folks, got a uh, relationship going. They, f they think just like Intelliversity has for a long time, hmm. that you have to focus on the CEO's ability to scale under stress. Hmm. And boy, one, once we found those winning characters, we can believe their projections. Hmm. Then, you, then we can pour money into them based on the revenues, mm -hmm. not based on a, a, some kind of future M&A or IPO. So how does that structure work, the revenues approach? But remember, it relies upon our ability to believe their projections, which is a human thing. Yeah. But on that premise, uh, we call those royalties, or revenue royalties, or royalty funding is what I prefer. Mm -hmm. uh, the technology, the, the terminology aside, this is where we as investors receive a fixed and declining, usually, percentage of revenues for a period of time mm -hmm. as a reward for our investing. Uh, the the, the uh, period of time and the starting and ending rates that are used are negotiable and dependent on the company and the market and the mm. projected revenues. But the concept is that we're not buying equity. We're not buying stock. And this removes the human conflict from the equation. Hmm. We, we are no longer concerned with putting pressure on the CEO to take the company, to sell the company, hmm. which of course destroys the company. We call it liquidity event for a reason, right? It right. Li li liquidates the company. 
But now we put we take the company back to where its roots are, which is to create a sustainable vehicle for growth and for innovation. Mm -hmm. And we're only concerned with one thing. Do they grow revenues? Which we can help with. We say we have contacts and distributors and other outlets that we can bring to the equation. We don't have to worry about the expenses, which takes all the conflict out of the equation. Mm -hmm. If we're constantly worried that this company is taking first class seats or um, uh, blowing out salaries, et cetera, which hopefully they don't, then we're, uh, that's, that's the wrong way to think about a company. Hmm. Um, because that's what profit sharing does. Now we're concerned with the wrong thing. Hmm. And we, we, it creates a stressful relationship between the investor and the, a, a, and between the investor and the entrepreneur. Hmm. We want to create a, a pr productive, creative, forward-looking relationship between the entrepreneur and investor. And the only way to do that is to invest in revenues. And then as revenues spike and go up, we get a larger share. If the, uh, pardon, not a larger share, but a larger dollar amount. Uh, if the revenues don't take off, we guess wrong. And we just, we're patient, help out as long as we can. Hmm. But it's a it's a win win relationship rather than a conflictual relationship. And is there some kind of guaranteed minimum? There can be. That's a negotiable position that you can have. Mm -hmm. Right. But the, the whole, what we want to avoid is uh, too many guarantees like that. Because if the company needs longer to to uh, achieve the revenues that it that it projects. Uh, it, it wouldn't make it would not make sense enough to drag draw cash out of the company during that period of time. Right. So we're in favor of minimizing the minimums, or the uh, you know the, the the minimum amount of of returns we get. Instead, we're patient investors want to see the company achieve its uh, projected revenue, even if it takes a little. Longer. So you do want to keep yep. an eye on the expense line as well, because obviously there's a limit to how many Maseratis you can have in the garage. But as long as you keep a reasonable collar on that type of expense, I understand what you're saying, that you don't, that the investors don't have to be directly and immediately concerned on a day-to-day -day basis with That's how right. much is being right. spent, as long as there's a, a, a sufficiently adequate profit margin to sustain the company's ability. You know, to we wouldn't invest in the company to begin with if the margins aren't large enough. Yeah. But we use a formula that the cost of client acquisition should not be more than a third of the net revenues of the company after cost of production, which in the case of a um, software company is zero. So um, we want we want the revenues to be at least three net revenues to be at least three times the cost of client acquisition. When I say the net revenues, I mean revenues over a three to five year period. Hmm. What, do you, what do you mean? So that by means there's a sufficient margin to cover the royalties. What do you mean by client acquisition? What does that term mean? Well, the, that's the advertising sales and other marketing costs to acquire a client. Okay. It's a very simple formula developed at MIT to predict, which is very predictive as to which companies will succeed and which won't. Okay. If the um, net revenues over a five-year period exceed the, uh, discounted by the way for common discount, exceed the cost of acquiring a customer by more than three, highly likely to be a successful company. So Rob, you're an investor for your own account and for your family's uh, family office investment. Yes. Um, and you also work with uh, companies and entrepreneurs who need to uh, who need to find this type of formula? Yes. Um, you you put on a boot camp, so you're kind of in the in the uh, mode of being uh, a coach and a torturer, I guess. Um, Both a coach and a torturer. Yeah. Thirty eight companies have been through the process. Uh -huh. uh, earlier on, it was less mature, and now it's very rigorous. Uh, and so far, of those, well, m way more than half have gotten their gotten cap. Right. It's been very successful. So and now, a, and now we're in a position, as we organize a new a new venture fund, to put money into the winners, for those that survive the boot camp. Rob, we're going to take a yeah. we're going to take a quick break here, for a message from our kind sponsors, and we'll be right back.
research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, yeah ah. this is the starting line. Hush! Ah. When this is over, you're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense for me and you. We're going to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Make it a better try a little more, more than every more. Let's do what we can. And we're back now with Rob Kramars at Intelliversity in California. Rob, I have a question now about the experience of the entrepreneur, the person who's put their whole life and all their eggs in every basket to bring a company so that it's ready for financing and they've identified a potential investor and they're getting into their VW to go down the freeway to make the pitch to that investor. Um, Talk to me a little bit about the factors that determine the relative possibility of success and failure in that addition, in that initial pitch meeting. What, what does that entrepreneur need to be primed with in order to ensure that he communicates effectively with that type of investor? Thank you for asking, because George and I are real students of this subject matter, and it's a key part of boot camp. The, there are two things that you have to be aware of, weak messaging, and wrong messaging. That people typically go on the, they produce weak and wrong messaging, and so we teach them to do, do the other strong and correct messaging. A weak message is a message that bores and confuses the listener. A strong message is one that they will remember to tell their partner the next morning. Okay. It's viral, it's exciting. It's more than exciting. It's exciting even the next morning. It's very important not to bore and confuse, which means it has to be simple and black and white. Uh, and it's counterintuitive because people just want to tell everything about their product and how wonderful it is and so on. That doesn't work. That comes later during due diligence. The second part is wrong messaging, which means that the entrepreneur is talking about his product or her product rather than about herself or himself. What works is establishing trust first. So you, you, what works is strong messaging, rather right messaging, is messaging about you as a person. Mm -hmm. Why you are trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And by trustworthy, I mean, why do you know that you can execute and scale the company under stress? What in your history proves that? Mm -hmm. Because that's what the investor is afraid of. Mm -hmm. Having experienced 90% of the investments fail, they darn well know that you're likely to fail no matter how confident you are. So you have to overcome this barrier wall of distrust, mm. this prejudice against you, that you're just a dreamer that can't execute. Right. And that's the proper conversation. Talking about your product makes you a used car salesman. We don't trust used car sales. So how do you come up with an effective viral statement that's just irresistible to investors? Well, I investors, let's not talk about clients, customers, the general public, the press. Let's focus on what investors are sensitive to. How, what is the process for coming up with that? There's no way, you, there's, everybody's statement. drunk their own Kool-Aid, so there's no way you can do it yourself. You have to work with others, mentors, advisors, friends, other other entrepreneurs. It takes typically five to six weeks, we found, of trying different messages on groups until one resonates. Hmm. And the only way to go to do it is to find out what resonates. We've had people complete boot camp, make their first investor presentation, and then they, it dawns upon them, because it comes out of their mouth, what will resonate. Hmm. What will become viral? Hmm. It's very different. It's very different than the first idea you had. Uh, it just doesn't. You can't do it yourself. It takes a village. So in it Southern California, if you were looking to develop your viral message, I guess you need a a, a group of trusted people who Absolutely. are going to be both receptive and critical. How do you find that group? Uh, are there are there centers in Southern California where people can go to uh, to, to get that kind of 
uh, of feedback? Oh, certainly. Oh, yes, of course. Well, our Entrepreneurs Boot Camp does supply that. Hmm. So you're always in a, in, a, in a group of observers every session giving their feedback. If you don't want to do the boot camp, uh, then the Connect in San Diego offers a program called, um, uh, boy, I forgot the name of it, but Connect does. Um, and uh, so does Lava. Uh, LA Venture Association up in the LA area. Mm -hmm. There are a number of other programs that uh, I wasn't prepared to, to provide you with all the names, but you can find them online or mm -hmm. just call me uh, and I'll they'll be happy to hook you up with uh, the, communi the community of advisors that helps um, companies do this very thing. And you may already have some of those advisors in your circle. They may be board members, they may be family members, uh, they may be school chums who have been successful, who are willing to share, share uh, some of their criticism. You, you need five or six people minimum, hmm. and you really have to trust them. If they tell you that that message is not something they'll remember in the morning, the following morning, then you have to believe it. Hmm. I, I don't know if we have time for this, but I'll give you a good example of it. Hmm. It's what, uh, if, you're, if you're a fan of, of history, what uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt told uh, Eisenhower when they were preparing for D-Day. Hmm. Uh, this is controversial, so what, what he said, what he, he had to have Eisenhower remember. So he said, the Russians are coming. We have to invade France. We have to use um, General Patton as a diversion. The Russians are coming, invade France, use Patton as a diversion. Hmm. That got Ike's attention because it was completely counterintuitive. They were coming up through Italy. Now, it's a very simple viral message that Eisenhower was able to take to his his people. Mm -hmm. Why are we Why are we doing this crazy thing called D-Day? Because hmm. we have to get to Berlin first. Because the Russians are coming. Because the Russians are coming, not the Germans. Yeah. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to make this a political statement, that's all history, but it's an example of a simple viral message that no one could forget. So sometimes a viral message actually sounds counterintuitive, right, at, a, oh, at first okay. blush. And the idea, I think, is to challenge people's expectations and shift their mind into a new space where they're thinking out loud, they're thinking, wow, oh, what the heck does that mean? Is that the sort of process you're looking for in a viral? Yeah, so um, it's sometimes counterintuitive, and it never expresses the full vision of the company. Hmm. It's always a small part of it. It's the part of it that the listener will, will remember in the morning mm -hmm. and will be excited to, to repeat. So, so much for detailed mission statements and vision uh, statements and so on. That, they, bore that can, and they bore and confuse. Yeah. That can be in the executive summary. That can be in the prospectus. Yeah. But it maybe doesn't belong in the first pitch meeting. Yeah. The, when you're the first pitch meeting, you're not... The entrepreneur is not really talking to a rational being. No. Oh. He's, he's talking to this very early evolutionary <laughs> part of the brain called the crocodile brain, which is yeah. concerned with, am I going to fight this person <laughs> or run from them, or am I going to mate, mate with them? So the and it's very, it's very subliminal and very, it takes about 10 seconds, 30 seconds at most, for the listener to decide, is this a friend or foe? So the VC is crocodile. The VC is crocodile. Uh -huh. better, better than a shark, because uh, that's, so that's another. What other? Experience. What part of the brain do you actually <laughs> want to be talking to, not the crocodile brain? What's that? Pardon me. What, what's the the preferred part of the brain, not the crocodile brain? The what? What should well, we be talking to? Well, you want to get to the human part, oh. the primate part, but you also have to get through the dog brain, which is concerned with who's who's the prize. Do you want to become like the dog whisperer? Uh, Cesar Romero, I think his name is, uh -huh. uh, it, it teaches that the the trainer has to become the alpha dog. Hold on one second. The trainer has to become the alpha dog. And in the same sense, the entrepreneur has to become the prize hmm. rather than the seeker. Oh. See, because the, uh, the, the venture capitalist sees a lot of opportunities. So you want to have a way to draw people forward rather than chasing them. You oh, want to yeah. get them to chase you, in a sense. 
Ironically, yes, you want the entrepreneur to be, pardon me, you want the investor to be so intrigued and entranced by your initial message that they are chasing you. You're the prize. Mm -hmm. that and, that can't, and that can't be done at a rational level. That has to be done at this subliminal level of, uh, of frame, what we call framing. Mm -hmm. But um, it has to be, the vision has to be so large and so impactful which is part of the viral message, that the venture capitalist or the investor wants to be part of that. Right. Well, Rob, so you, you provided us with some really valuable insight, some great ideas, and there's so much more. Obviously, we can only cover so much in a few minutes, but I think we've given a kind of a viral uh, taste of what you and Intelliversity are up to. And it'll be valuable to just about everybody who sees it. And thank you once again, Rob, for your time. And so long from Think Tech Hawaii.